नमस्कार वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन परस्पेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज सायरा मुश्तबा एंड विथ मी इज रेणुका ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेज ऑफ द बेजर डिवेलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शुड ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस India's external affairs minister Dr S Jay Shankar calls on Sri Lankan president Gotabaya Rajapaksha in Colombo assures him of India's continued cooperation and understanding with the island nation Nepal prime minister Sher Bahadur Deoba to visit India from the 1st to the 3rd of April and the invitation of prime minister Narendra Modi Russia and Ukraine to hold fresh round of talks in Turkey Taliban orders airlines in Afghanistan to stop women from boarding flights unless accompanied by a male relative. Indian Minister Anurag Singh Thakur holds meeting with CEO of Dubai Corporation for Tourism and Commerce Marketing Isam Kazim. Oscar Awards 2022 announced in Los Angeles. Will Smith wins first Oscar as Best Actor. Dune wins six awards and Coda takes three. And in IPL cricket Lucknow Super Giants set a victory target of 159 runs before Gujarat Titans at Vankhede Stadium in Mumbai. Inter's external affairs minister Dr S J Shankar who is in Sri Lanka called on President Gotabaya Rajapaksha in Colombo on Monday. They reviewed various dimensions of the close neighborly relationship Dr Jay Shankar assured him of India's continued cooperation and understanding. He also called on Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksha. The discussions were followed by signing of an agreement on supporting Buddhist culture and heritage. The external affairs minister virtually toured an ongoing camp in Jaffna on fitting the Jaipur fort. He also virtually inaugurated the Jaffna Cultural Centre constructed by India. The external affairs minister visited Lanka IOC, a subsidiary of Indian Oil Corporation in downtown Colombo on Monday. He said, "An Indian line of credit of 500 million dollars is helping Sri Lankan people in their everyday lives." He began his Sri Lankan visit by meeting Finance Minister Basil Rajapaksha Monday morning. Dr. Jay Shankar said they discussed the economic situation and India's supportive response. He said India will continue to be guided by the neighborhood first policy. The external affairs minister met Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Thailand Don Pramudwinai on the margins of the Bimstek ministerial meeting. They discussed global and regional issues as well as taking Bimstek forward. The external affairs minister will participate in the Bay of Bengal initiative for multi-sectoral technical and economic cooperation Bimstek ministerial meeting on Tuesday in Colombo. Prime Minister Narendra Modi will attend the fifth Bimstek summit on 30th of this month. The summit, which is being held in a virtual mode, will be hosted by Sri Lanka, which is the current Bimstek chair. In today's hot spot section, we bring you a discussion on discussion on significance of upcoming Bimstek summit. In conversation are Mr. Yogendra Kumar, former ambassador, and Manas Pratim Bhuyan, journalist. Mr. Kumar, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will attend a virtual summit of the Seven Nation Bimstek grouping on Wednesday. The Bimstek, uh, which is an acronym for Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, has emerged as a key platform for regional cooperation, particularly in areas of connectivity, trade, and people-to-people -people contact. As Bimstek comprises India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Myanmar, Thailand, Nepal and Bhutan. Do you think this grouping can become more relevant and agile as cooperation under South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation or SARC has not been moving forward particularly because of Pakistan's indifferent approach to arch containing cross border terrorism? How do you see the cooperation moving under Bimstek and Prime Minister attending the virtual summit of Bimstek on Wednesday? Well, I think uh, Bimstek is a very important sub regional organization. The reason as you mentioned that for south asia and uh, bay of bengal region i think this is one organization which actually has much greater potential and it's far more effective than sarc now sarc is not effective as you know for primarily two reasons one is that pakistan has a very non cooperative attitude towards sarc because they are geopolitically linked and geoeconomically linked to china and therefore you find that from every point of view they have actually in a way hitched the wagon to china in terms of cpac and so on and so forth the second thing of course is sadly the tragic developments in afghanistan 
have also meant that Afghanistan, which is part of SARC, that also is no longer, in that sense, an, a kind of a member of an organization which will cover South Asia. So what you actually have is that short of these two countries, we have all the remaining SARC member states. Along with that, we also have Myanmar and Thailand. The only problem now we have here is that, as you know, that some countries in the BIMSEC region, they are actually having their own internal problems. We know about Myanmar, which actually in a way is experiencing diplomatic isolation. And even India actually is very sensitive in terms of, let's say, interacting with this country. And then you also have, let us say, uh, quite uh, serious domestic problems in Sri Lanka. And Nepal is still emerging from the kind of a, let's say, uncertainty, economic and political uncertainty, which is experienced in recent times. So we have these challenges, but it is still much more effective because member countries in one way share a common geopolitical objective, a common geopolitical purpose. So I think it has great potential, but even that potential by itself is not enough unless actually it has to be taken to, let's say, a somewhat higher level. And you have to understand now that because of the fact that we have had the COVID crisis, which has caused setback, economic setback and geopolitical setback, and then you now also have the Ukraine crisis. So because of these two things, you have the, the health issue, the economic recovery issue, the supply chain issue, and geopolitical uncertainty. So in one way, now this BIMSTEC actually has to chart a completely new course for this particular, let's say, phase in international relations and in, in regional developments. Ambassador Kumar, uh, the External Affairs Ministry in a statement on Saturday said that the COVID pandemic related challenges, uh, the uncertainties within the international system that all BIMSTEC members are facing imports greater urgency to the goal of taking BIMSTEC technical and economic cooperation to the next level. So how do you see this statement by the Ministry of External Affairs? Can BIMSTEC evolve itself to become a vibrant platform for regional cooperation like that? ASEAN, how do you see it? Well, even ASEAN is now facing a little bit of a problem, let us say, because Myanmar is a member of ASEAN as well. So you see that kind of a geopolitical situation is getting somewhat mixed in South Asia and Southeast Asia. But what the Ministry of External Affairs have actually have said is that there is a clearly uh, defined, a crystallized agenda for BIMSTEC to be taken at a higher level of regional economic cooperation. Like you rightly mentioned, I mentioned to you, of course, COVID has caused a setback. It has caused economic setback and social setback, and they've had a political fallout. So you find that the health infrastructure actually is something that's affecting all the countries, member countries of BIMSTEC, and also it requires a very different, a holistic kind of approach, which the Prime Minister has been talking about, and the WHO also is quite mentioning as to what should be the approach in the post pandemic phase whenever it begins because the pandemic is not over. Now, in terms of uncertainties, I've also mentioned to you that we, because of the fact that you have the geoeconomic, or the, the global economic recovery somewhat taking, developing after the, the COVID-induced economic shock, but the complication of that is the supply chains. And these supply chains are a function both about the economic disruption caused by the, by the pandemic in different regions, in different countries, and also the tensions arising from geopolitical uncertainty, A, first triggered by the pandemic, and now you have even greater tension with regard to Ukraine. So supply chains would again become a very serious challenge. Supply chains also means lack of availability of inputs of production, lack of established markets for finished products, and even commodities like petroleum products, like uh, other commodities, like food grains, and a whole lot of other issues that actually fuel the economy of any country forward. So these supply chains actually are going to become even greater challenge as we go along. And one upshot of that is rising inflation. So under India's uh, presidency of an export group uh, last year, a BIMSTEC master plan for transport connectivity was finalized. So this, this master plan actually envisages a seamless uh, multimodal transport system across the region with efficient transit facilities to enhance the mobility of goods and people. So do you think 
time has now come for BIMSTEC to focus on specific areas like transport, like connectivity, so that in fact it can boost trade and investment, the intra-regional trade and investment. So how do you see BIMSTEC moving forward on the master plan for transport and connectivity, which was finalized under India's presidency of an expert group? last year. I think this is again a very critical aspect of BIMSTEC uh, cooperation. We also know that BIMSTEC being a kind of a bridge organization between South Asia and Southeast Asia, so in one way easily fits into the larger sort of uh, infrastructure connectivity plans for the entire region. So actually it helps a great deal in not only advancing India's strategic interest in South Asia, but also in Southeast Asia. So it fits in very well with that and you mentioned that seamless transport is one issue. And India is involved, as you know, in some of these transportation connectivity projects via Myanmar. We also are, you know, there's also the, the shipping cooperation agreement. So, I mean, easier shipping within in the Bay of Bengal region, for example. You also have, I mean, facilitation of that. So, in, in terms of port development, I mean, they can bring in Sagar Mala into it. And the entire issue of standardization and, and regulatory framework for the operation of ports, for freight and uh, forwarding. And, and all these things will then get linked up to production centers in different parts of the BIMSEC region. So it actually is very critical. And at this time, actually, again, it has taken to an even higher level because whilst we know that there is turmoil in Myanmar because of which the, the surface transport actually is not quite so easy, but certainly in the shipping sector, a lot more can be done. And the government is working on that. And here, in fact, as you know, the Sagar Mala and all, the entire conception in envisaging Sagar Mala as to how to develop. So all of that can fit in very well with our uh, objective and our vision as to what the BIMSEC should be, let's say, in the post-pandemic phase. We have been witnessing geopolitical flux because of a variety of reasons, including the crisis in Ukraine, development in Afghanistan, situation in the Gulf region. So we are witnessing some sort of a geopolitical flux, uh, so to say. So what kind of focus or what kind of cooperation do you see from when is this summit of the beam stack? What is your expectation? Right. I think we need to be also a little realistic because uh, as you know that we are having for the first time Myanmar participating, but Myanmar's participation will be at the virtual level. Their foreign minister and the other officials will be doing that. And even the summit, although it's a virtual level, it's, it's a virtual platform, there the representation of Myanmar would be actually that of the foreign minister. So you understand that there are, you know, these kind of bit of a mismatch in terms of, let's say, the nature or the level of diplomatic engagement between let's say, the, the member countries of BIMSTEC. So that is one factor that we have to realistically appraise when we actually think as to what we should be doing further. But it is significant, actually, as you see in the from this summit onwards, is that we expect the adoption of the charter of BIMSTEC. This is actually extremely important because, it, as you understand, the charter lays out everybody's responsibilities and you know, it gives it a more legal enforcement. Then, of course, uh, connectivity master plan we've already talked about. Then we also know mutual legal assistance arrangement, cooperation between diplomatic academies, and we also now envisage the setting up technology transfer facility in Colombo. So you see that in a way, the building blocks for cooperation actually is quite considerable. I mean, you know that under the BIMSTEC, there are, India actually hosts four centers. There is Center on Energy, Center on Weather and Climate, which is linked to National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting for Tourism and Traditional Medicines. The threat of terrorism is a major challenge uh, facing the region, including so many BIMSTEC countries facing this cause of terrorism. So what kind of cooperation you envisage under the framework of BIMSTEC in dealing with terrorism and extremism? Well, we actually have, as you know, this uh, agreement on mutual legal assistance. This actually will provide the framework for cooperation amongst the member countries. But everything cannot, for example, be done, you know, within this kind of a formal basis, as you know, with Myanmar, because of our the relationship becoming a little more delicate. We have cooperation in regard to security related cooperation, but yet it actually cannot take a formal shape. But at the same time, the national security establishments in all the countries, they actually keep in close contact with each other and share, as I said, you know, whether it's robbery at sea or whether it is transnational crime or whether it is keeping track of the, the you know, the, 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 the terrorist extremist elements. So all that actually requires this kind of cooperation. And the more, let's say, as I said, this organization develops, you know, a kind of a 
more solid basis, not just at the leadership level, but also at the institution level, at the different agency level, then these issues can be addressed, I think, quite effectively. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Kumar, for your detailed perspective about BIMSTEC and the expectations from the upcoming summit on Wednesday. Thank you so very much. Thank you. That was our hotspot section. And now in some more news. Nepal Prime Minister Sher Bahadur Deuba will pay an official visit to India from the 1st to the 3rd of April at the invitation of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. He will be accompanied by his wife Dr. Arzu Deuba and a high-level delegation. This will be the first bilateral visit abroad by the Prime Minister of Nepal after assuming his office in July last year. The External Affairs Ministry said in a release that Mr. Deuba will call on Vice President Venkaya Naidu and hold talks with Prime Minister Modi on the 2nd of April. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar and National Security Advisor Ajit Dobhal will call on the Prime Minister of Nepal. The first India-Bahrain Foreign Office consultation was held on Monday in New Delhi. It was co-chaired by Secretary, Consular, Passport, Visa and Overseas Indian Affairs in the Ministry of External Affairs Dr. Osaf Saeed and Under Secretary for Political Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Dr. Sheikh Abdullah bin Ahmed Al Khalifa. Both sides appreciated the momentum in the multifaceted ties between the two countries. They also discussed regional and multilateral issues. This is All India Radio giving you the news. For quick news updates round the clock, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. Russia and Ukraine are set to hold a fresh round of talks in Turkey. Russia's foreign minister says the president of Russia and Ukraine could meet for talks only after the key elements of a potential deal are negotiated. Sergei Lavrov said on Monday that the meeting is necessary once they have clarity regarding solutions on all key issues. Lavrov's comments follow Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's statement that he is ready to discuss Ukraine's neutrality and security guarantees with Russian President Vladimir Putin to secure peace without delay. Zelensky added that only a face-to-face -face meeting with Russia's leader could end the war. Russian and Turkish negotiators are set to hold another round of talks in Istanbul on Tuesday to try to draft an agreement. The government of India has said that the geopolitical tension between Russia and Ukraine has led to global supply disruptions resulting in steep increase in global commodity prices including those of crude oil, gas, edible oils and fertilizers among others. In a written reply to a question in the Lok Sabha, Minister of State for Finance Pankaj Chaudhary said, the government is closely monitoring the global price movements and their impact on the country's economy through trade. The Taliban have ordered airlines in Afghanistan to stop women from boarding flights unless accompanied by a male relative. The latest restriction on women follows last week's shutdown of an all-girls secondary school just hours after they were allowed to reopen for the first time since the hardline Talibani seized power in August. Two officials from Afghanistan's Ariana Afghan Airline and Khmer said that the Taliban had ordered them to stop boarding women if they were traveling alone. Since the Taliban's return to power, many curbs on women's freedom have been reintroduced. These restrictions are often implemented locally at the whims of regional officials from the Ministry of for Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice. Pakistan's National Assembly on Monday resumed its crucial session where the opposition tabled the no-confidence motion against Prime Minister Imran Khan. Soon after, the session was adjourned till the 31st of March. Earlier, Interior Minister Sheikh Rashid said a no-trust motion would take place on the 4th of April. India's Information and Broadcasting Minister Anurag Singh Thakur, who is in Dubai on Monday, had a detailed discussion with CEO of Dubai Corporation for Tourism and Commerce Marketing, Isam Khazan. They talked about various strategies adopted by Dubai in respect of tourism sector to make it a preferred tourism destination for the world. Mr. Kazim mentioned that Dubai's success has been possible owing to the decisive leadership with a focus target. Mr. Kazim mentioned that India has great potential in tourism and India can utilize the unique aspects of key cities or states and focus on the strength. He said India's IT talent benefits the global industry which can be promoted as a strength. Indian Minister Anurag Singh Thakur invited Mr. Kazim to India to discuss further on collaboration opportunities in the tourism and media and entertainment sector. Later, Mr. Thakur held a conversation with actor Ranbir Singh on the global reach of Indian media and entertainment industry at the India Pavilion at Dubai Expo 2020. 
He said, Indian people in Dubai are the real brand ambassadors of India. India's Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises, MSME, and the Entrepreneurship Development Institute of India, Ahmedabad, is organizing a two-day mega international summit on MSMEs from Tuesday in New Delhi. We have a desk report. Entrepreneurs, academicians, policymakers, industry leaders, thought leaders, business chambers, industry associations, startups, social impact organizations, MSMEs and self-help groups from India and across the world will attend the summit. National and international experts will deliberate on subjects such as challenges and opportunities in the MSME sector amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, role of incubators or accelerators in MSME's growth, role of conducive policies and non-financial business development services in MSME competitiveness and how how MSMEs can work in consortia to achieve sustainability will be discussed in the summit. Sustainability being a major point, a special panel discussion has been lined up on people, planet and profit in the light of MSME sector development. Discussions will also encircle MSME's competitiveness, internationalization of Indian MSMEs, technology and innovation, digital transformation of MSMEs, entrepreneurship, ecosystem and emerging opportunities in the MSME sector and gender and disadvantaged communities entrepreneurship. Anita Anand for World News, All India Radio. At the 94th Academy Awards ceremony, Will Smith won the first Oscar of his career for his performance in King Richard. Jessica Chastain won the Best Actress Award for The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Best Supporting Actress Award was won by Ariana DeBose for West Side Story. Coda was the big winner of the night, winning the Best Picture Award. The film was nominated in three categories and won all three. The other two are Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Supporting Actor for Troy Kotzer. We have a report. The 94th Academy Awards Ceremony, presented by the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, honored the best films released between March 1 and December 31st, 2021. The ceremony, hosted by Regina Hall, Amy Schumer and Wanda Sykes, takes place at the Dolby Theatre in Hollywood, Los Angeles, California this morning, Indian time, where awards are being given in 10 categories. These are some of the prominent awards declared so far. Best Supporting Actress, Ariana DeBose, West Side Story. Best Sound, Dune. Best Cinematography, Dune. Best Documentary Short Subject, The Queen of Basketball. Best Visual Effects, Dune. Best Animated Feature, Encanto. Best Animated Short Film, The Windshield Wiper. Japanese film Drive My Car won Best International Feature. Kenneth Branagh won the Best Original Screenplay Award for Belfast. Sian Hader wins Best Adapted Screenplay for Coda. Samuel Jackson, Elaine May and Liv Woolman will be honored with Honorary Academy Awards for 2022. The Jean Hirschholz Humanitarian Award will be handed over to Danny Glover. Ravi Kumar, AAR News, Delhi. And now let's take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. Let's take a look at the press reports on China. ASP writes, Shanghai will launch a phased lockdown to curb an Omicron-fueled COVID-19 outbreak that has hit China with its highest caseloads since the early days of the pandemic, the city government said Sunday. Bloomberg writes, Shanghai became China's biggest virus hotspot after reporting another record increase in daily COVID-19 infections. Many major houses reported searchers find second black box of the crashed China Eastern Airlines plane. Xinhua reports a memorial event was held on Sunday at the crash site of the China Eastern Airlines plane to mourn the deaths of the 132 people involved in the accident. Reuters reports China's state-run Xinopec Group has suspended talks for a major petrochemical investment and a gas marketing venture in Russia, heeding a government call for caution as sanctions mount over the invasion of Ukraine. Forbes.com writes China violates the Philippines' sovereignty while Russia distracts the U.S. It writes, while the world focused on Russian troops amassing at the Ukrainian border, China blatantly violated the Philippine sovereignty, presumably so it could spy on a U.S.-Philippine military exercise. Business Standard writes China is responsible for carrying out the most cyber attacks and is motivated primarily by a desire for gaining access to secrets and fulfilling its political objectives with the help of such attacks, reported a Canada-based think tank, International Forum for Rights and Security. 
Let us have a look at what made headlines in Bangladesh. The government of Bangladesh placed the Mass Media Employee Service Conditions Bill 2022 in the Parliament on Monday, reports Daily Star. The bill seeks to fix the wages and benefits of journalists, employees and press workers, artists of broadcast, online and print media outlets. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has called the U.S. sanction on some serving and retired senior officials of its allied law enforcement agency, Rapid Action Battalion, as very con condemnable act reports BSS. The half-day strike called by the Left Democratic Alliance in Bangladesh against strike rise ended with a clash between the police and the supporters of the strike on Monday, reports Dhaka Tribune. Now let's have a look at what made the headlines in Nepal. Economic Times carried the headline, No agreement on Belt and Road Initiative as Nepal toughens stand amid Chinese Foreign Minister's visit. The report states that the two countries failed to sign an agreement on Belt and Road Initiative, BRI projects and the accompanying loans, with the Himalayan country asserting that it will not accept any project that comes with strings attached. Economic Times reports India will host Nepalese Prime Minister Sher Bahadur Deva during 1st to 3rd of April in what will be his maiden foreign trip since his re-election last year. The publication reports that during his visit, cross-border connectivity and healthcare projects built with Indian assistance will be inaugurated. Khabar Hub reports Nepal Airlines Corporation, NAC, has resumed Kathmandu to Mumbai flight services after almost two years. Nepalnews.com writes that Israel's employment for Nepalese workers, which has been suspended for a decade, has been blocked yet again. According to the Himalayan Times, Nepal Ministry of Health and Population is to administer vaccine against typhoid targeting children from 15 months to 15 years of age. Let us have some brief news from Afghanistan. Ariana News reports that Afghanistan has taken delivery of another shipment of wheat from India, which was transported through Pakistan's territory. According to Dawn News, five convoys of Afghan trucks collected 10,700 tons of wheat from India, which is part of the total 50,000 tons of wheat pledged by the Indian government. The remaining 39,300 tons are likely to be collected by Afghanistan under humanitarian assistance by the end of next month. Amnesty International quotes its South Asia director saying that it is calling on the international community to make women's and girls' right to education a red line during negotiations with the Taliban de facto authorities. Newsweek headline reads, Taliban clamps down, stop airing some media reports, foreign TV shows. According to Spanish international news outlet, Agencia EFE, four radio stations were taken off the air in the southern Kandahar province and six workers were arrested. Pajwal reports that Qatar would be open red present, charity officers in Kabul, while Indonesia has pledged to support educational institution in Afghanistan. On to sports now. In IPL cricket, Lucknow Super Giants set a victory target of 159 runs before Gujarat Titans at the Vankari Stadium in Mumbai on Monday evening. Chasing the target, Gujarat were 98 for 4 in 15.2 overs when reports last came in. And now a quick look at the headlines once again. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar calls on Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajpaksh in Colombo, assures him of India's continued cooperation and understanding with the island nation. Nepal Prime Minister Sheikh Bahadur Deva to visit India from the 1st to 3rd of April at the invitation of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Russia and Ukraine to hold fresh round of talks in Turkey. Taliban orders airlines in Afghanistan to stop women from boarding flights unless accompanied by a male relative. Indian Minister Anurag Singh Thakur holds meeting with CEO of Dubai Corporation for Tourism and Commerce Marketing, Isam Kazim. Oscar Awards 2022 announced in Los Angeles, Will Smith wins first Oscar as Best Actor. Dune wins six awards and Coda takes three. And in IPL cricket, Lucknow Super Giants set a victory target of 159 runs before Gujarat Titans at the Vankari Stadium in Mumbai. And now before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan, by artists from Zimbabwe.
And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News. Thank you.